Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate you joining me. And today I'm going to be talking about the biological effects of COVID-19 on the brain. I know the Omicron variant is wreaking havoc. I myself is just getting better um, from this virus and I know its effects firsthand and I'm able to, you know, warn you guys to be able to take certain precautions, make sure you wear your mask, make sure you so social distance, even though that's not something that we're stressing right now, the N95 mask, I'm encouraging you guys to wear, and especially important, make sure you get vaccinated. It's really important. All right, so I'm gonna move through. I'm gonna look at some mental health issues that we're noticing with COVID. Um, and so in a report published by the Lancet Psychiatry 2021, COVID-19 survivors experience mental health and neurological disorders within six months of the infection. So they're looking at persons who were recently diagnosed with COVID and then they're looking at persons within six months of the infection and looking at the effects of long COVID. Long COVID is, is what they are calling it. Researchers analyzed data from 236,000 patients diagnosed with COVID-19 and they found 34% of those um, recovered patients have mental health issues. Now that's significant because a 34% would indicate a one in three. So out of the total of 14 brain disorders, here are some of the more common disorders that they identified. Mood disorder, anxiety um, were the most common followed by substance use disorder and insomnia. Another 2.1% had ischemic stroke, 0.7% dementia, and 0.6 brain hemorrhage. And I'm going to go a little bit more into the stroke and dementia as well. There are also neurobiological changes. So Dr. Maura Boldrini and her company from the John Hopkins University have been examining how neurobiological changes in the brain caused by inflammation affects cognitive and behavioral symptoms. Since the pandemic, many neurobiologists have been able to study COVID-19 infection and mental health. They have observed that patients recovering from COVID-19 have new onset of delusions, hallucinations, anxiety, and depression. I'm going to delve a little bit into especially delusions and hallucinations because those two are characteristic of psychosis right? So there are different types of hallucinations. They have, you have auditory hallucination where you see some things that other people might not necessarily see. There is um, sensory hallucination where you feel something. Most people would report like they feel like something crawling under their skin. Um, sorry, I, I made a mistake. I said auditory is you hear, <laughs> sorry, and visual is you see, right? So those and delusions, you you have certain concepts or certain perceptions, uh, a lot of paranoia that persons are out to get you and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of symptoms that we're actually seeing from someone with COVID-19 um, recovery. Neurobiologists believe new psychiatric symptoms may be caused by the body's response to the virus, triggering a release of chemical known as cytokines in specific areas of the brain associated with psychiatric conditions. These include the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the nucleus accumbens. And we are very familiar with these parts of the brain as they relate to emotions and emotional regulation. So increased cytokines disrupt the production of neurotransmitters which are natural chemicals, which act in brain cells to communicate with each other. The COVID-19 information also contributes to, to the death of neurons and to brain cells. So the COVID-19 inflammation kills brain cells, um, basically. The COVID-19 infection often associated with, with small, 
blood clots and inflammation when viewed during MRI scans. I'm sorry, this thing is toying with my screen. Yeah, put it away. When viewed with MRI scans, sorry, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Okay, yeah. So um, when viewed with MRI scans and EEG scans, the individual's brain resembles persons with traumatic brain injury as they would normally see in football players. So persons who have had a history of playing football with a lot of blows to their brain would have severe brain injuries. And this is the kind of injury that we're seeing when, when they do these EEG scans and these MRI scans on persons who have recovered from COVID. And we know that once you have that TBI or traumatic brain injury, you can have rapid changes in your personality. Um, you become very aggressive. You suffer from um, health disorder, mental health disorders such as anxiety and even suicidality. So we are actually seeing, seeing an increase in suicidality among persons who have recovered from COVID-19 as well. Extensive studies are being done on analyzing <clears throat> the different records of deceased COVID-19 patients and who presented with neuropsychiatric symptoms. They're also analyzing brain tissue in detail, looking at pathogenic pathways, measuring microglia, cell damage, and other inflammatory um, markers in the brain and these patients. So many studies are going on all over the world, not just in the United States. They are actually teaming up. I know the, well, the World Health Organization has formed a, a group of 25 to do some research. So they're teaming up and looking at COVID-19 patients who have fully recovered, COVID-19 patients who have long COVID, and they also are doing post-mortem on COVID-19 patients who have actually died. Now, let's talk a little bit about the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is a thin, a thin sheath that covers the, the, the brain. Usually it prevents chemicals from going into the brain. Um, so, so chemicals such as alcohol and water um, are usually the ones that you know, could pass the blood-brain barrier. They are noticing that the COVID-19 virus enters the blood-brain barrier, um, passes through that, goes into the brain. And in a study that was done in three people, they found that supported research detected COVID-19 in the neurons and in the cerebral cortex of the brain. In another study published in the Journal of Neurobiology of Disease, researchers found COVID-19 spike protein could cross the blood-brain barrier and infect brain cells. So it's more than one studies that have been done to confirm that COVID-19 actually does go through the blood-brain barrier and it does affect the cortex and the neurons in the brain. Other researchers believe that the COVID-19 virus can enter brain stem and the cerebellum through the circumventric organs. The loss of smell that occurs in some patients with COVID-19 could indicate that the virus entered through the olfactory bulb which is located right above the nose and communicates information about smell to the brain. So because it enters the olfactory bulb, persons always complain that they are losing their sense of smell and they're losing their sense of taste. That is the gateway or the pathway to direct entry into the brain. In a study done by Delphine Janieri, Angelo Carfieri and company, and this was done in Italy and published in the JAMA Psychiatry, Psychiatry Journal. Uh, they looked at a total of 381 consecutive patients who presented to the emergency department with COVID-19. It's the same as the SARS-CoV-2 right? and recovered. And what they did was they made a referral um, for post-recovery health check. And they found that they found that using the standard, which is um, 
the DSM-5, CAP-5, um, for di diagnosing post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the same thing we call PTSD, they found that quite a number of these persons develop or present with PTSD, even though they never had any mental health disorders prior to contracting COVID, right? So of the 115%, 30.2%, right, were diagnosed with depressive episodes, hypomania or hypomanic episodes, as we call it, a 0.7% of those ended up with generalized anxiety disorder, 7% psychotic disorder, and patients with PTSD were more women. So we're finding too that the COVID-19 is affecting more in terms of mental disorders, of course, more women than men. So it's saying that 55.7% um, of the women reported higher rates of psychiatric disorders, delirium, agitation, um, on acute illness, right? Than the um, 44.3 as it relates to men. Scientific leaders, including the Alzheimer's Association and representatives from more than 25 countries are working together with technical guidance from the World Health Organization. And they, this is an ongoing study. So we don't have the results for this one or these studies that are ongoing right now. Um, but I'm sure we're, we're going to not be startled by the outcome based on what we're already seeing. So the World Health Organization, they're tracking long-term impact of COVID-19 on the brain. And they're looking specifically at Alzheimer's um, disease. The study aims to better understand the long-term consequences that may impact the cognition and function, including underlying biological problems that contributes to Alzheimer's and even other dementia disorders. Also, there's another study that's running. The National Institute of Aging recently called for grant proposals for funding, you know, to fund projects exploring the impact of COVID-19 on degenerative disorders and the aging process. So we see many, many studies that's going on right now. Those will be more long-term. We probably will get the results in a few years, but we already know based on the studies that we've seen so far that has been published and pre-published that the COVID-19 is causing havoc um, in mental health. And just yesterday, I don't know if you're watching Yahoo, there was a report on mental health that the mental health is in crisis and they had several interviews from persons from different states stating how they have been impacted by COVID so far. So we know that there will be um, great need for mental health services to come. We will need more providers, we will need more resources. Um, this is actually very scary um, of what we're going to be facing in, in the next you know, year to, to few years. Now, we are looking at in other ways in which COVID-19 has actually affected the brain. And, and so one other area that we look at is the study of cells, certain cells. And we look at these particular cells known as astrocytes. And studies have suggested that the COVID-19 infect these astrocytes. And the astrocytes are really a cell that's abundant in the brain and has many, many functions. Astrocytes do lot, um, quite a lot that supports normal brain functioning. So this COVID-19 virus is attacking the astrocyte cells. So we're looking even to, to detail as to what exact parts of the brain it's affecting, which neurons it's affecting, exactly what the damage that is being done. Um, and and, and this, this particular study is done by the University of California um, by Dr. Cranstein. In February of last year, a preprint that it had analyzed brain samples of 26 people who died with COVID-19. And they found in five of those persons, brain cells showing evidence of COVID-19 infection, 66 of the persons had um, death of the um, astrocyte cells. 
infected astrocytes could explain some of the neurological um, symptoms associated with COVID-19, especially, I'm sorry, this click. Yeah, especially fatigue. Um, I myself suffered from fatigue this past week um, with my COVID um, positive. I, luckily, I, I, I am vaccinated, so I didn't have the very bad symptoms that many persons suffer from, fortunately. But I experienced a lot of fatigue. And they're also saying there's depression and brain fog. Many persons that I've spoken to have mentioned that they have brain fog and that's a long COVID. They will report brain fog for a while. I'm, I'm reading that the brain fog stays probably up to six months with some individuals. You know, you have this memory gap, this forgetfulness, confusion sometimes. Um, and that's a, as a result of the brain fog. And I know, I, I know it's still early because we're in the second year of COVID. So we're not even too sure what that would mean later down in terms of memory if these things will be more long term right but we know that those kinds of symptoms may reflect it to neuronal damage and definitely dysfunction in your brain then they looked at the other cells called the pericytes and this is a study done by dr david atwell is a neuroscientist at the university of London, and he and his colleagues published again. This was also a preprint because it's it's early days. They're publishing their evidence that they have, but they're doing deeper research. And so they or they use um, hamster. They looked at slices of hamster's brain, and they found that um, the COVID nineteen blocked the functioning of the receptors on parasites and causing capillaries in the tissue to actually die, resulting in stroke. So these will, you know, um, and we have seen many persons with COVID who have got ischemic strokes. So we know that there is definitely a relationship between the damage of these parasites um, cells and the COVID-19 infection. Parasites are cells found in small blood cells called capillaries throughout the body and in the brain. And this is believed to cause permanent damage and constriction of the cells. So other ways in which COVID-19 affects the brain. So we, are, we, we, we talked a little bit about brain fog. There's confusion, loss of consciousness. Some people lose consciousness, seizures. We're seeing more persons reporting seizures after recovering from COVID. Loss of smell and taste, even though that's an immediate symptom of COVID, we're finding people are also reporting long-term loss of sense of smell and taste. So um, even like for my coworker, she got COVID in early 2020 and she still does not have the ability to smell. And tasting, she tastes some stuff like if it's really salt but or salty, but she doesn't have her taste back. Right. Then there's headaches. I know for sure that with this Omicron that I got, my headaches were severe um, and we're getting that as a symptom from COVID too. I don't know about the long-term dam damage of headaches as well. There's trouble focusing, changes in behavior. And I'll talk a little bit about the changes in behavior. We're also seeing, and this I saw this firsthand um, of a young man who was diagnosed with Jelen Barr syndrome. He's actually in the nursing home right now. He's totally paralyzed. He reported that he was perfect before COVID. He had no men mental health or medical symptoms. He developed COVID, he said, and um, he developed the Jelen Barr syndrome. Changes in the body from high fevers to low oxygen, levels multi leads to multiple organ failures and contributes to four account you know dysfunctions brain dysfunction such as delirium or even coma increase in strokes so i mentioned that earlier with the parasite cells increase in stroke in younger people due to hyperactive blood clotting systems which is usually more active in younger adults so this increases the risk of blood clots we know that for sure um, so 
what does this mean for nursing care? I know that I should have quite a few nurses on right now, especially from the Bellevue Hospital. Thank you so much for coming. What does this mean for you guys? What does this mean for the nurses at KPH or the University of the Hospital? Projections suggest a major surge in post-acute care demand and will occur following the hospital surge in involving patients with COVID-19. The discharge of patients with COVID-19 from hospital becomes complicated. Um, what do I mean by complicated? So for here in Massachusetts right now, we have no ICU beds available. It means therefore, that at some point they have to do, you know, a narrowing down of who gets to go to the ICU or who's even um, admitted in the hospital, you know. And, you know, we've heard all these reports coming out of different states that, you know, they will prioritize if they think that you are much younger with an ability to live longer, they will admit you. And if they think you're older, more feeble with more vulnerable or underlying conditions. And you know, that's so sad. And, and, and so people also are being pushed out of the hospitals before they've even fully recovered with other men medical problems. And they're, sent, they're sending them, I know for the United States here, they're sending them to like skilled nursing facilities, you know, to continue their healing process um, and treatment. And sometimes these facilities do not uh, have the equipment needed for that level of care. So we're having a lot of complicated um, discharges from, for patients coming out of the hospitals. Besides, increased infections, we'll be seeing more mental health conditions and we'll be seeing more behavior. So if we're saying that persons with COVID-19 who have recovered and you know they might have you know other problems like muscle problems because they were in the ICU for so long, they have to actually learn to build, build muscles and walk again. They will need to be in a rehabilitation facility, but we will see a lot of mental health behavior. So we'll see aggression, we'll see acting out, we'll see wandering, you know, we'll see more dementia and stuff like that. How will the nursing staff be able to deal with those and manage those behaviors since they probably are not even equipped to manage certain behaviors? So again, that's complicated, you know, um, what facility would they be referred to? You know, we have, where the healthcare system is heading for a crash in terms of availability. We, especially with the Omicron um, but, um, strain, it's really taken a toll on most of the states and there's really not enough resources to treat it. So, some of the problem behaviors I mentioned a little bit earlier, but let's look at some more, you know, we'll see the memory loss, which is the brain fog. Think of your relative that is in a nursing home and, and has memory loss. What will that person look like? What will the behaviors look like? They're missing their family. They're not sure why they're there. They had a gap in memory. You know, we'll see the older folks wandering. We'll see a lot of wandering we'll see delirium, we'll see delusions, we'll see hallucinations, anxiety, and we will see a lot of depressed um, patients. We'll also see psychosis, which is what I mentioned earlier, where we'll have persons hallucinating and having active delusions. We'll see more substance use. You know, um, again, the substance use population is you know, affected because a lot of them are homeless and we know that um, these virus strains, especially like the Omicron, they go through the congregate areas, like they're tearing through those. So what's the likelihood that those persons will be affected? What's the likelihood that these persons with substance use have a vulnerable or underlying condition? We know that substance users, especially if they use opiates, will develop you know, pericard um, pericarditis and and, and, and other problems that might take them to the hospital because of infections. Um, they might have heart conditions. A lot of them develop um, skin conditions and so on and so forth. And so we will see a lot more medical problems um, with substance abusers. And not only that, 
we will see more substance abusers being admitted to the hospitals. And, and with all the other you know, social and economical um, aspects of COVID-19 where people have lost their jobs, you know, people have lost their houses, they're tending to go more to substance use. So we will definitely see an increase in overdose. You know, um, I mean, I cannot tell you how many people I see on a daily basis with overdose. And I also own a sober house and, you know, looking at my population and I've also lost people in the sober house from overdose. So I know firsthand how that's affecting the substance use population. We see a lot of medication seeking behaviors in the skilled nursing care in the hospitals because these persons have a history of substance use. And if they're not able to get their medication, when I say medication, their drugs, then they are going to try to seek and get other medication that can make them feel better. We'll see a lot of manipulative behaviors um, because we know that too, for that population of substance users, they're accustomed to manipulating. That's pretty much what they do to get their drugs on a day-to-day -day level. And so now as nurses, as primary care providers, as counselors, you know, as support staff, we have to deal with these kinds of behaviors that we're not necessarily trained or equipped to manage. Other mental health diagnosis that we'll see and Renekis is, is actually very common to people who use alcohol over a period of time. They are saying that they're seeing more Renekis and it could be because more people were using alcohol. I know um, for the United States that when they made the call um, in early 2020 that the bar, not the bars, that the bars and the, the liquor stores should remain open. I saw a lot of feedback on Facebook. How could they make liquor stores open and they close hairdressers and nail salons. Well, you know, people who are addicted to alcohol, if they are just um, taken off alcohol, if they don't have proper um, detoxification, you know, observed detoxification, it's likely that they will end up with a seizure and it's also likely that they would die. And so the call to leave the liquor stores open, I believe was a really good call, but on the flip side to that, we had more people drinking. So for, for example, alcohol use disorder went up 20% in 2020. Um, I'm not sure what the exact figures for 2021 is right now, but I would imagine that it's significantly increased as well. So we have more people who are showing up to the skilled nursing care or the rehab or the hospital with Wernicke's disorder and Karkasov syndrome and more young people, we're seeing younger people. You know, I saw uh, a female who was 23 who already had were naked to the point where she was not even verbal um, at this point. You know, and when I read her files, she actually was drinking wine every day, right? So we're seeing an increase in these kinds of behaviors, uh, sorry, disorders. We're seeing a lot more dementia related behaviors. We're seeing an increase in Parkinson's. Um, so this, this COVID-19 has affected us significantly. How do we care plan for these patients then as nurses, as providers, as counselors? So we, in, in our facilities, we have to think you know, um, of ideas and think innovatively. The, we have to come up with extra activities to, you know, occupy them. We, it's really good to have, especially for the substance abuse population, like group meetings. I'm not sure what each facility's rule would be on around outsiders coming in and facilitating meetings, but it would be a good idea to be able to have even people from AA or Smart Recovery or any other support group come in and do some group meetings. It would be good to have support groups. So you have like a depression support group or you have some, you know, a psychosis support group or anxiety, um, or you might have like a DBT group for persons with disorders like borderline personalities and so on, right? We have to step up on our assessments. 
it's really, really, really important for us to carefully assess the clients when they come in um, and be able to care plan for their needs. We need more staff training and staff education, especially around mental health. I'm stressing this because I work in the field and sometimes, and, and I come in contact with nurses and doctors every day. And, and I see that a lot of the nurses are not equipped. They are not taught these things in school. They're not taught anything about substance use disorder. And they don't know how to manage these, this population. And so we need a lot more education and staff training. We have to revise care plans more frequently. Some of us, you know, as nurses, we're inundated with work, I get it. And so the care plans are not updated as they should every 30 days, every 60 days, every 90 days. And so we might have all these behaviors, but the care plans have not been revised and we do shifts. So one staff, you know, observed a particular behavior, but that was never recorded, no follow-up. And then that staff leaves and go home and another staff comes on and then bam, the behavior is still there. And now it's probably escalated to the point of hospitalization. So we need to make sure that we, we track these things, that we revise the care plans, we update care plans constantly, and we add our new concerns. If we have any new needs, we add those to the care plans as we move along. We need to have more family support. We have to have family you know, being more involved uh, and it's hard to say this because I'm saying we need more family support, but when we have COVID in our building, it's so different because we can't have visitors, you know. Um, luckily for us, we have this forum of Zoom in which I'm using right now. We can actually do Zoom family meetings and we can do family meetings via phone calls and so on and so forth. Um, for the safety of our, our, our patients, we need more room searches. We need to be able to and I know that borders, especially for the United States, it borders on their rights. Um, but we, in order to keep our, our, our patients safe, we need probably to see what's, what, what they have in their rooms. Because if they're, if they're hallucinating, if they're having delusions, if they're having um, episodes of psychosis, if they're substance abusers, you know, they might not be safe. If they're having suicidal thoughts, um, and, and we don't know if they have an intent to harm, we have to make sure that we keep, try to keep them safe. Okay? We also need more behavior meetings and safety contracts. That's something that I would encourage nurses to do more is to contract for, for the client, even if it's a verbal contract that we have some contracts for safety. I think it's very important that we assess suicidal behaviors. And I'm not gonna throw it out there, that although I'm probably speaking specifically to um, providers, to nurses, family members need to be more aware of suicide and suicidal ideations and to be more in tune with family members. We've had, I can't tell you every day that I look um, on TikTok or I look on Instagram or even just general Yahoo or Google, I see people committing suicide um, there was a suicide for this 17 year old kid who is the son of a famous Irish singer and actress, you know, like these things we're not paying attention to. It's really important for us to assess suicidal behaviors. If persons are saying they're not hopeful, if they're giving away their things, if they are talking about finality and calling you to thank you for all the things you did for them, those those could be cues into the fact that someone might be suicidal and we need to really pay special attention to that. And for the healthcare workers, it's a time for, of burnout, you know. Um, they worked all through COVID. Some of them couldn't even get vacation time. They worked long hours, 80 hours sometimes. You know, they are burnt out. Sometimes they see too much, you know, all these deaths of people, probably death of a close friend. They have lost their own relatives also. And there's also vicarious traumatization that's going on too, right? So these nurses are burnt out. These doctors are burnt out. These therapists are burnt out. We are burnt out, you know, by listening to all these things and 
trying to help our patients and moving along with our own issues and all the socioeconomic issues that's going around, um, it's really hard to keep afloat. So be mindful of this and um, be your brother's keeper and look out for especially these suicidal ideations. There'll be more psychiatric mental health evaluations needed. You know, uh, we're doing a lot of studies, but we need more psychiatrists in the hospitals. We need more counselors in the hospitals. Residents and clients and patients need more evaluation and more mental health treatment. So as a nurse, if you identify that, um, you know, a, a, a patient is showing up with psychiatric problems, make sure that person does not go home without a referral, you know try to follow up, try to even provide resources to that person and the person's family so that they're able to get the treatment that they need. For workers, for your fellow staff, there's usually EAP um, in your facilities. If you could do referrals for your staff, you don't have to go to the staff and say, hey, I noticed something is going on with you and you know, I'm gonna make a referral. You could actually go to your HR department and make a referral for the staff. Say, you know, you know, I, I see John Brown, he's acting really weird, I have some concerns, and I think that you probably should refer him for EAP. EAP is usually very confidential. Um, there's never usually a report back to the facility about how treatment is going. It's usually just getting the staff out to, to getting the help that they need. Yeah. Encourage people to, to, and staff to take their vacations and to prevent these staff burnout. Encourage self-care. So my question to you is, how are you taking care of yourself? What are you doing for self-care? And self-care could mean just going to the nail salon and getting your nails done. I, I know it's COVID and we're very cautious, but maybe you could, you know, buy something and do your own nails or, you know, try to get a massage or, you know, go to the beach. When if you know if it's not like here where we have deep winter, um, go sledding, go you know do something fun, uh, do an activity, play a game, join a club, you know, join a book club, read, something like that. But engage in proper self care so that you don't lead to um, burnout yourself. So I know I know we are doing YouTube. I don't think that I have the option for questions. I'm not sure. Tasheka, do I have the options for questions? Any questions? No questions. Okay. All right. So thank you so, so very much. I hope this um, provided you with some information. And um, I can actually leave my contact information with you if there are any further questions and you need any clarification or if you just need a little bit more information. Um, again, my name is Marcia and my phone number is 508-981-3301. My email is aicsllc at outlook.com. And if you have any questions, please, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful evening.